Hello, Global Gardeners. It's great to see everybody here on a Monday, a day before the solstice hits. And we'll be talking about gardening on and near and how we're going to use the solstice as we proceed through the conversations today. Nice to see everybody. Throw your questions out there. Participate. We have our wonderful moderators, Jay and Heidi, at hand to do a wonderful job, as they always do. It's nice to see everybody checking in. Jean is already talking about a uh, garden being under a foot of snow. We've had a lot of snow in a lot of regions here in the United States. Gary A. Sue Hooper is talking about a record 84 degrees Fahrenheit predicted. That's 29 degrees Celsius coming up in a couple days. And Earthly Spaces from Holland is expecting zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit tomorrow. So it's crazy weather. I'm actually going to be having a pretty mild week in my garden after some crazy winds this last week. We had winds in my area sustained over 40 miles per hour with regular gusts between 75 and 92 miles per hour. And my garden actually held up pretty well. The only thing that happened was my gate blew open and I was wondering where Mala was a couple days ago. I went out looking for her and she was roaming the front and the neighbor's yards and having a wonderful time because the gate was open as a result of that windstorm. Luckily, my greenhouse is well intact. I took some video of it. You'll see that in future videos. So I'm so glad that I went with the Planta greenhouse because it held up to those winds extremely well. And the rest of the garden did too. Some of the mulch blew away, but for the most part, everything is looking good in my garden. I hope everything is good in your garden, be it cold or hot or covered with snow, whatever the situation happens to be. Laura saying, I've been so lazy after the outdoor growing season ended. I've not grown any fresh greens or herbs inside. You know, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today is as how I approach the solstice. And so the solstice is the point in the year where this, the Earth's tilt is at its most. And this happens twice in the orbit around the sun. And so tomorrow, the winter solstice, the Earth will be tilted away from the sun the most in the northern hemisphere. But it's also tilted most toward the sun in the southern hemisphere. So for those of us in the north, this is going to be the longest night of the year and the shortest day. And for those in the southern hemisphere, it's going to be the longest day and the shortest night. And because we have these clearly defined dates, points in our calendar, I use them as anchor points for my gardening year. And so for the winter season, kind of like Lar, I've been pretty lazy over the last couple weeks. There are some seeds that I was planning to do and I didn't do, and some cleanup I was planning to do and I didn't do. But I used the solstice as kind of the wake-up point. That's the day that I really start working toward getting ready for my spring season and for the, the rest of the growing season that's about to come. Because every day the day is a little bit longer and every night the night is a little bit shorter and so the winter solstice is actually one of my favorite gardening days because i can anticipate we're getting closer and closer and closer to the planting outside but it's also that point that i have to kind of kick myself and say okay the lazy days of late autumn are done now it's time to actually do the planning, do the preparation, and get ready for what's going to come this next summer. And I, I find it helpful. That's why I call it, it, it's an anchor point. Anchoring my activities around the winter solstice in particular really gives me that opportunity to move forward into the direction I want to go. If you don't have a date or something along the lines of an anchor point in your planning, well, it becomes so easy every day to just put it off for another day. And so tomorrow, 
one of my traditions on the solstice is to sit with all of my seed catalogs and go through them and actually place some orders. I've been looking through the catalogs and I've been circling and making notes of things I want to try, but the solstice is the day that I use to actually take some action, to actually get some stuff started. And it's gonna take me a few days because I like a lot of seeds and the plan will come together right about the beginning of the new year. But by then I'll either have ordered my seeds or have chosen all the seeds that I'm planning to order so that the beginning of January I can get started on the season. And this is the day tomorrow that it all starts. On the summer solstice, I find it a bit depressing in the garden because the garden is beginning to fade from that point on. But as an idea behind the anchoring of the garden season, I use the summer solstice as the point of the year when I do an evaluation of my garden. What worked? What didn't work? There's still time to do a fall season in the garden after the summer solstice. And so what does that mean as far as getting the seeds, doing the planting, doing the preparation for that late season planting and harvest? So these are action days for me. These are days that, that I no longer have the excuse to just coast and let things happen. I use the solstice as days to move forward. So how about you? Share some of your thoughts about solstice, any activities that you have, things that you like to do on the solstice, traditions you might have, and any questions you have about the solstice as well. I want to say hello to the kitchen garden with Eli and Kate. It used to be the old tradition that you planted garlic on the solstice. And so Eli is in Scotland, and that would make a lot of sense. That's a uh, a zone, a couple zones higher than my 5B garden. And so the beginning of winter, late fall, it's often time to start your garlic in zones 7 and 8 in particular. So great suggestion. Nice to have you here. If you look in the description below, you'll see a link to a video on the channel, The Kitchen Garden with Eli and Kate because they did a great job putting together a compilation video about different methods of composting. And one of those clips is from me talking about Hugo culture. So check out that video on the Kitchen Garden with Eli and Kate. And it's great to have you here today participating with us. So glad you could make it on this Monday. That's awesome. Luna Cat is saying, I've got 13 strawberry plants and longevity spinach currently under grow lights. I need a new grow light for the new seeds. I will be starting soon. The, I, this, is, this gets back to the solstice. I've been so bad about getting my lights ready and getting my pots ready. And so this week I'm using the, the jump start of the solstice since the day is shortest. I'll be inside more. Uh, to get started with my lights, but uh, I feel your pain because I've got a lot of seeds I still need to get going and and I want to get some more lights growing as or going as well to to make that work. Eric says I'm about three minutes behind, but we had a couple good wind storms recently in Michigan too. My full size trampoline blew about 60 feet and landed on top of my wood trailer, but the garden held up well, so <laughs> there's a bright side to that. Crazy crazy winds that some of us had in addition to those crazy tornadoes that recently just tore up the middle of the country. So it's, it's that time of year. We typically seem to have more weather extremes near the solstice just because it's when winter's starting and it's when summer is ending. But we've just had some craziness as far as the weather for a lot of us, uh, definitely. I know that's one of those things that, that we have to deal with in the garden, but it's part of the planning as well. And I talk about this all the time, that you have to develop your garden plan for your garden specifically. And this is where observing the weather patterns really comes into play, especially when we start having these weird weather patterns. And weather is different than climate. Climate is a long-term series of weather events. And so we might be in a dry climate or a wet climate, 
and and my climate it tends to be very dry throughout the year it tends to be hot in summer and cold in winter we haven't had any precipitation in august now these are weather events the lack of precipitation but this is the kind of thing that it's helpful to keep track of within your own garden what kind of patterns do you see in your normal weather and so it's normal in my region to not have a lot of snow in november and december we get most of our snow in april believe it or not and so uh, this is one of those things i always track so within my garden as i plan the beds and my activities i take into account that i can usually be out in december working because we don't get a lot of snow events this year we've had zero but little snow is normal as i proceed into spring i have to take into account that i'm probably not going to be able to do a lot in april because we're going to be getting a lot of weird cold spells and snow so start thinking about those kind of things as you 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 figure out your gardening year and I did a video about this earlier in the year track your sun and shade and so the solstice is a really cool day so if you go outside tomorrow your shadow is going to be longer on the winter solstice than any other day of the year and on the summer solstice your shadow will be shorter than any day of the year and you can actually map out your garden if you're looking to put in new beds you can map the sun and shadows within your landscape by using the solstices as the points that you you use for bookends, if you will, of how your shadow plays across the ground. I went out yesterday and measured my shed, just a simple garden shed that's by my raised beds. The shadow yesterday was 50 feet long. It extended all the way across to where I have my my perennial bed where I'm doing my pollinator plants and I it was just crazy I've I've looked at it before but anticipating that I was going to be talking about it today I actually went out and measured a 50 foot shadow from my garden shed well it's going to take quite a while for that to change at the peak of summer that shadow is about two feet so everything between those shadows it impacts if i'm trying to grow plants well depending on the time of year those plants will be getting more or less shade because of the way my shed casts it from the sun's angle in the sky so start looking at those kind of things get out tomorrow you can do it today but tomorrow is a great day just to say you did it on the solstice and start looking at your garden from a sun's perspective and it might open your eyes a little bit. It might be one of those things that you learn a little bit about the weather and what's happening in your garden when you look at those kind of things. So I, always fun to, to, to take advantage of. Uh, Lars says, looks like a brown Christmas defined by less than one inch of snow on the ground. I don't remember the last brown Christmas and he's 62 years old. Uh, yeah, we're definitely having a brown Christmas here. No chance of a white Christmas anywhere near us. Our mountains may get a little bit of snow, but um, we're certainly not expecting it. Sarah Hannon says, I watched a video of Charles Dowding talking about his winter plantings before bed last night and had nightmares about aphids. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, it's it's funny. When I, when I watch, I tend to watch my videos early in the day uh, because I've had similar events when I watch my gardening videos at night all my my dreams and potential nightmares have to deal with the garden that late so i think that's funny yeah uh, connie says that's a real gardener when you dream of aphids um, and i was actually thinking about the aphids in my garden uh yesterday because we've talked recently about magnet plants about those plants that you put in with the intent of attracting aphids and other pests so that they leave your main garden alone and i had that happen with uh, one of my shrubs last year and i was walking past it and thinking i probably need to take some cuttings grow some more of that plant and then use that as a magnet plant 
it it was here when I moved into the house. So I don't know exactly what it is. It looks like a type of current, uh, but I was thinking from an aphid perspective of putting some more of those plants around the garden and see if I can get them to attract all the aphids this next year. It's one of those things that uh, magnet plants can can really make a difference, and and we definitely have talked about that in recent days. There's Jay right on top of things with the link to the kitchen garden with Eli and Kate. Thanks for that, Jay. I, I, I love that channel, and Eli and I are communicating much more often these days, particularly once I collaborated with this video that they did. But uh, I love that channel. So I know some of you have already uh, moved over there and are watching regularly, but if you haven't, definitely check out that channel. And Yankee Sista is back with us this Monday. Always nice to have you here. Thank you for that super chat. Thanking our Heavenly Father for a wonderful garden year with the guidance of Gardner Scott. We'll celebrate my birthday the 23rd, then Christmas. Happy holidays. Well, an early happy birthday to you. My birthday is the week after Christmas on the 30th. And it's not always the best time of year for a kid to have a birthday within a few days of Christmas. So I'll, I'll give you my sympathies right now for everything I know you've endured by having a birthday on the 23rd. But this year, I hope it's a wonderful birthday and I hope you have a wonderful holiday week and as we approach the new year. So nice to see everybody saying happy birthday to you as well. Empress Kimberly says, would love to use magnet plants to keep the Japanese beetles away from roses. I'm not aware right off the top of my head. Japanese beetles are one of those that, that have very specific plants they like to attack like roses. And so an aphid tends to be a little more indiscriminate. Uh, and Japanese beetles tend to work well when you trap them, if you put traps specifically designed for Japanese beetles. But I'm not aware of, of magnet plants. So if any of you know of magnet plants for those Japanese beetles, definitely share them with Empress Kimberly because that's the kind of stuff that's always nice to, to share. Connie says, my little loquat trees are aphid magnets. They seem to love the new leaves. And that's what they're after. If you think about an aphid, they're, they're a sucking insect, very, very small. And so they're not going to be like a caterpillar where they're chewing the leaves. They suck the leaf. So they need to be able to pierce the leaf and then suck the fluids from it. And new, young, green, tender growth is what they're going to be feeding on. And so that's one of those, those observations that you can make. You'll see aphids on young plants. And you won't see many aphids on old plants. And so that's, that's like a, at the end of the year with your tomato plants and pepper plants, those plants that have really become hardened, you're really not likely to see aphids on those old, tough plants because the, the, the skin of the leaves is just too thick for the aphids to, to, to penetrate through. You're going to see them early in the season when you have a lot of that tender growth. And so that's not unusual. And that's why when you, when you find a magnet plant and put the magnet plant in, you do need to match the basic growth pattern of the magnet plant with the plant you're trying to save. And so if you're trying to save a plant because the aphids are eating that young, tender green growth, well, the other plant, that magnet plant, needs to also have that young, tender green growth for it to be most effective. And you might need to plant those magnet plants more than once through the growing season so that they, that they will always be there as that delicious treat for the aphids. And so I don't think we've talked much about that aspect of it, but it is one of those things that... that that you, you need to do regularly. You don't just do the plant once and expect that it's gonna deal with all the aphids for the whole gardening season. You may need to put some of those plants in uh, and different types of magnet plants at different times of the growing season. 
Okay, let's see. It looks like we've got Simplify Gardening that's also checked in. Tony from Wales in the Simplify Gardening channel. Another great channel. I know a lot of you are also regular watchers of Tony. And I hope you're doing well, mate. And it's nice to see you here on this Monday. It's already uh, afternoon in the UK for those of us that are starting off in the morning. But still a great way to have this global audience sharing everything that we can about gardening. Patricia Barr, thank you so much for that super sticker. I really appreciate it. That's that's a nice way to to start the day, of course, and, and I do appreciate all the contributions. That's so nice. And nice to see everybody welcoming Tony as well. Mage Grey Wolf says, I didn't plant any citrus over there. It sprouted on its own. And so let's go ahead and talk about the background because this is Mage Grey Wolf's garden, a picture that was sent. And so I appreciate that. I did a call out for some new backgrounds and a few of you responded. So I'll be showing some of the other gardens over the course of the next couple weeks as well. And there's a lot about this garden. So most of what's happening in the garden right now, as Mage Grey Wolf shared with me, a lot of flowers, there's some onions, there's uh, still, still lots of plants, but not the big active garden that would normally be taking place. But I wanted to point out a few things that I observed. I always like to, to learn something new from, from everyone's garden. And so I appreciate you sharing your garden with us, especially for those of us that are brown and dry right now and nothing's growing. It's nice to see the green. But I really like what you've done back here. And so there's some back here and there's one right here down in this bottom left corner. And it, it's such a simple way of gardening in containers. And that's just to take plastic bins and bury them in the ground. Now, burying them in the ground is a great idea because it really helps to moderate the temperature within that container because the soil, the, the ground, is going to maintain a relatively consistent temperature during the growing season. And moving into the winter, it will tend to stay a little bit warmer than a container that we would have just sitting on top of the surface. And so by burying them, you help moderate that soil temperature within the container. But it's just a really easy way to have a container. You don't need anything fancy. Just get a plastic bin and grow your plants in it. I, I of course, and I'm assuming this is the case that, that you're using, do drill holes in the bottom or else you might end up with a swimming pool for your plants because the water would have nowhere to drain. But drill some holes in the bottom you can actually start your plants in a container like that indoors or in a cold frame or in a greenhouse and then move them outside to an area like this. So great idea for containers is these, these movable plastic bins. I just love that idea. And you really can't see them. My, my body is blocking them, but in this area directly behind me, uh, they have some grow bags and growing uh, lots of different plants in this area directly behind me. And of course, the metal back here, that, that corrugated galvanized steel beds, great way to go. As, you, as you've seen in some of my videos in the last year, that, that big series of beds that I built this year are all the metal beds and they last and they're strong and they're easy to put together. So I'm great, uh, or it's great to see that, that you have a couple of those beds. So, so thanks for sharing this, this space with us. And it's nice to see some green growing for those of us that aren't in a zone that we can actually have plants growing at this time of year. But uh, it's so nice to be able to share someone else's garden. And I'm so glad that you're participating and letting us know a little bit about some of what you have growing in the comments. So that's nice. Uh, I agree, Frank, totally. Uh, another big reason that I drill holes in the containers that I'm using is for the soil life, back and forth. The bacteria, the fungi, and the earthworms will go from your native soil into those containers. And it's so cool when in my containers, when I'm 
harvesting or putting in transplants or whatever it happens to be to come across earthworms in a container bed because I don't often put earthworms into those beds. They just find it naturally. So put holes in the in the, in the bottoms and the earthworms will find it. It's it's absolutely absolutely incredible. So Noni Snowflake, nice to see you checking in. Great to have you here. Carla says, I have a friend that has a mobile garden by using totes with holes drilled in the bottom. When she goes to the next job, she gets her RV spot and out come the containers for growing. That's awesome. I I I know a gardener who who does that with five gallon buckets. That exact his whole gardening is in five gallon buckets and it's a mobile garden he he does have a house but he moves the garden from one spot to another based on the sun at different times of year so it's mobile gardening definitely whether you're doing it in an rv or doing it in a house wonderful way to garden if you feel you're limited that that's a solution get some buckets get some containers and you can have a garden uh, even if you don't think you have the space. And if you're doing it in an RV, I'm quite impressed. I think that's that's a great way to, to do it. So thanks for sharing that. Celeste says, just fed my chickens the spent microgreens, planting new ones today. Basil and cilantro are on the way. That's great. I'm going to be, this is another one of those things, and back to the solstice idea of action points. I've been meaning to start microgreens for weeks. It's going to happen because I got no more excuses. My gardening season starts tomorrow. No more end of season. It starts tomorrow, and microgreens are on my list as well. So I'm glad to hear that. I'm definitely going to use that as, as incentive to try to get moving. Let's see. Brian is saying, any benefits in adding green sand in potting soil mix? Yes and no. And so if you've seen the video, it's an it's one of my older videos where I show how I make my potting soil mix. I talk about adding blood meal and bone meal and green sand to the potting soil blend. Those are slow release organic fertilizers. And the green sand in particular is adding potassium in addition to a few other minerals. And so from a potting soil perspective, if, if what you're doing is just growing plants to then put out into your garden beds, the green sand really doesn't add much to the blend because it's going to take a long time for that, that potassium to be available for the plants to use. It requires all that bacterial action in the soil to make it into a usable uh, material for, for the, the, the plants. And most of what we're starting in our potting soil and putting into the garden really isn't going to benefit from that. But if you take a long-term approach, if you're practicing no-dig gardening or you're putting your plants into containers, areas that aren't going to get regular amending of the soil, you're not going to get in there and be turning in organic matter, then something like green sand can be beneficial because when you use it in your potting soil and then you transplant that plant into your container or into your no-dig garden, you're now adding some green sand and it's amending the soil where you're transplanting those plants. And so from a long-term perspective, it can have benefits. It can be a way to incorporate some of those nutrients into your soil. But for short-term purposes, uh, no, it really doesn't have much benefit. It, it's a mineral, uh, and so it just takes so long to break down and, and become usable for the plants that you, you probably won't see much in, the, in that first season, or at least the first half of the season if you use green sand. But, but I'm doing more and more of that with my potting mixes because I'm recognizing that I'm trying to get to that point where I'm going to be amending less and I'm going to be turning over the soil in my beds less. And so if I can incorporate something like green sand and some of those other minerals and slow release organic fertilizers, then in the long run, it will benefit my 
soil in those beds. So I hope that helps you, Brian. And it, it, it's a nice thing, you know, nice natural way to, to get some materials into your soil that you might not have. So Celeste is asking to define green sand. And so green sand is, is mined. It, it, it comes from ancient um, seas and, and I think large lakes, basically. And so it's, it's mined, it's, it's a sand, and that sand has different minerals, but is particularly high in potassium. And so that's why it's used in addition to, to blood meal, which is high in nitrogen, and bone meal, which is high in phosphorus. And if you use something like green sand that's high in potassium, that's in the MPK, the big three uh, fertilizer needs that, that we often add to our garden. Whereas the blood meal and the bone meal are coming from animals, they are slow to break down, but they'll break down and be usable sooner than the green sand. So the green sand tends to be more of a long-term solution uh, because it is mineral-based and and the the adding those minerals back into your soil that might be deficient in those nutrients really can be a good way to go but yeah go ahead and look it up there you can buy it they sell it in bags and just do a search for green sand and you'll find a number of sites that are selling green sand uh, a lot of the home centers sell green sand i know my nursery sells green sand so it's it's one of those things that you can definitely find uh, just by a, a simple quick look for those type of things so um, honey didn't says sorry late for class you're you're not late you're just showing up because you had something else that was taking your time and of course you can always back up and watch things on replay so uh, nice to have you here as well uh, one of the other things that, that I, I want to talk about as far as the the solstices are concerned as gardeners we we often just focus on our own garden and what's happening but gardening has its roots in farming and agriculture and so this is another one of those things that, that's kind of fun to do near the solstice because you'll often see articles in magazines or newspapers and there's a lot of stuff online but but the historical significance of particularly the winter solstice i just find fascinating that so much of of how we look at farming and life in general uh really has its roots at the winter solstice because for ancient civilizations this was the point when the days started getting longer and so you get back to to some of these ancient structures be they Stonehenge or the pyramids, you'll often find some correlation to the winter solstice, then the way the shadows fall on this particular day, because it's on the winter solstice that these ancient civilizations would mark the beginning of the growing season, that the days are going to start getting longer, and so it'll be time to start planting seeds and planning for the crops that will be coming. And so it's more than just a date on the calendar. If you look back thousands of years, it's been a very important date on the calendar because it impacted the food production for entire civilizations for an entire year by knowing what date was the winter solstice. And I've got this in my long-term plans. At some point, as I build out my garden, I want to build one of those, those, those structures. I'll make it kind of arty, but where the, the sun shines either at sunrise or at, at noon on the solstice, you can build some really cool things in your garden. And so the sun will only shine through the hole on sunrise of the winter solstice or whatever approach you want to take but i think that'd be kind of a cool way to to add some artwork to the garden is by focusing on these two dates in particular and seeing how we can recognize and acknowledge these dates within our own individual gardens so 
I'm, I'm well away from when I would actually be doing that. Uh, but look for it in a couple years ahead. I'll try to figure out what kind of mechanism I'm, I'm going to use. But especially yesterday when I was looking at the shadows from my shed, uh, I thought it'd be really cool to build some kind of pole in my garden. And at the end of the pole, on noon, on the winter sol or at noon on the winter solstice, I'll have something in the ground to mark that, that point. And then at noon on the summer solstice, I'll have something in the ground. And so between this pole and those two points, I'm imagining some type of garden art. But uh, I've got lots of time to figure it out, and, and I'll definitely be looking for ideas from others as we get closer to that. So there's Diane says, good morning, Gardener Scott. I decided to switch gears and do just a pollinator garden this coming season. Would there be any issues if I plant sour flower seeds in the beds I use for vegetables? Oh, no. No issues whatsoever. It's a great idea. Go for it. I love it. It's the, the only issue might be if you're planning on doing vegetables in those beds again and you're planting perennial flowers in those beds, then at that point you've got to decide if you are going to take out the perennials to put in vegetables or if you plant your vegetables around the perennials, which is a great way to garden is to mix your flowers with your vegetables. But no, there's there's really no, no issues. I wouldn't be concerned about any disease issues or pest issues. You're not going to encounter any of those kind of things when you're putting flowers into vegetable garden beds. But I love the idea. I think that's awesome. And and that's one of those things, looking at it from a long-term perspective, one of the hardest things for many of us who are trying to attract pollinators is to get the attention of the pollinator. And so if you have a garden without many flowers, you probably don't have a lot of pollinators because the pollinators just don't know that your garden is there. And so if you take a year like this, I, I really do think it's a great idea. You can focus on putting in a lot of flowers, put in those perennials, put in those native plants, also do some grasses, also do some herbs, and that will really attract a lot of the beneficial insects. But once you attract them, especially when you take the next step, which is to think about their habitat, they might like a brush pile to overwinter, depending on the insects you're talking about. They might like specific plants that they will overwinter on. You do this all in one year. You focus on these kind of plants, developing the habitat, attracting these insects, and they'll find your garden. Then let them set up residency. Now in future years, when you revert some of the garden to vegetable gardening or fruit gardening, the insects are already there. All those beneficials came in during the year that you focused on attracting them, and you'll have them from here on out. And so that's a great way. If you notice that you just don't have those pollinators and those beneficial insects, yeah, maybe take a year off from vegetable gardening, or at least cut way back on your vegetable gardening and increase the number of flowers that you're putting into your landscape. And I bet you in the years ahead, you'll see more success with your vegetable garden because you have all those beneficial insects that now know where you are. And that's that's one of the hardest things to, to figure out. So I wonder, I, I really like that idea. I'm, I'm still building and developing, um, but that's one I've got the space and to actually have a dedicated area for those kind of plants. But I'm also still working toward incorporating more and more flowers within my vegetable garden bed. So uh, wonderful, great idea. Laura Full says, have the city build a roundabout in the middle of the street so you can take over the area in the middle for gardening. My city is roundabout crazy, like when cows circle endlessly. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot more of this in the States where as roads are built and uh, particularly new developments and often in areas where they're rebuilt, they're putting in the roundabouts. And here in Colorado Springs, many of those roundabouts, like Laurel is talking about, have gardens. 
and at least in my city, those gardens need to be sponsored by somebody. And so I, I see a lot of garden clubs. There are a lot of uh, organizations that are maintaining the gardens within those roundabouts. So that's a great idea. Every city and town should have a parks department or, or some department that is responsible for the plantings in on city property. And if this is something that interests you, check with your city because they're probably wanting to do a lot more plants than they can. They just need somebody to, to maintain that area with weeding and pruning and putting in plants as necessary. And often they'll pay for the plants. You just gotta go in and do the planting yourself. So uh, that's, that's a nice idea. Now, whether you can actually have the city build the roundabout for you, um, that's debatable in my area. That's actually, there's so much new building going on near me that it's actually pretty easy to, to get involved with that planning process for the roundabouts. But as far as getting the garden built, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely something that I think is a doable option. So thanks for suggesting that. Celeste says, I had weevils get into my sweet peppers this summer. So I planted garlic in there this fall. I'll move the peppers somewhere else this coming spring. Hope it helps. Uh, yeah, let us know about that. Garlic is one of those things, I've talked about this before, if you plant garlic throughout the area, it, it can often disrupt some of those insect pests to the point that, that they won't find the plants thereafter. Uh, so yeah, let us know how that goes. Uh, the uh, It's not not too late, like Eli was saying, for, for many of you to put your garlic in. In fact, this may be a good time to go ahead and start your garlic. For some of the rest of us, our garlic beds are pretty much frozen and any growth that was happening has slowed or stopped as they're dormant for the winter. But think about it for next year. That's what I did this year was to put garlic into some of those other beds uh, just as extra plants. Uh, most often in the past, I've had dedicated garlic beds where the whole bed was garlic. This year I'm doing the same thing. I'm mixing it up and putting garlic throughout the garden in different areas. So hopefully that'll all pop up. Rudimental Gardening says, may set up a small butterfly habitat. That's awesome to allow butterflies to reproduce and release into the garden area. Always been fascinated with their life cycle and adding pollinators to the areas of plus. Great idea, great idea. And, and again, the idea of the habitat, giving them what they need for their entire life cycle. Now, one thing, and, and it, it, it's interesting, I, I get comments about this all the time. People who want butterflies in their garden and then want to know how to get rid of the caterpillars in their garden. Well, that's where understanding the life cycle really can be important because butterflies come from caterpillars. And so you have to accept that you're going to lose some of your plants if you have a butterfly garden. But if you're putting in the plants that the that particular caterpillar likes, then it, yes, absolutely, I completely agree. It's so, another fascinating aspect of gardening is to, to, to know that you have a particular butterfly in your area that you're trying to attract. And then you see the caterpillar that matches that butterfly in your garden. But then to take it to the next level, which is to recognize that those caterpillars have favorite plants. They have plants that they're going to eat more than others. And, a, and especially with the monarch butterfly, milkweed is its plant of choice. So if you want to attract monarch butterflies to your garden, then you should be growing milkweed and you should accept that the caterpillars are going to be eating that milkweed. And then when they, they, they one day start changing and the chrysalis develops and, and you keep an eye on that chrysalis that might be dangling from a branch or a leaf, and then suddenly one day it opens up and you've got butterflies. I had a garden club meeting this last weekend and one of their gardeners was talking about that within their greenhouse. They had uh, some, some butterflies come in and lay eggs 
and the chrysalis developed and the butterfly emerged and they were able to watch the entire process, which is just so cool. So uh, yeah, setting up a butterfly habitat, wonderful idea. Don't forget water. The butterflies should have a water source. Doesn't need to be a lot of water, just a, a, a simple stone with some water on it is often enough, but that's part of the the habitat, part of the importance of, of having the, the butterflies come and stay so that you can see all of that. But great idea. Pollinator gardens, the butterfly gardens. Uh, it, it, it really is taking gardening to the next level. And if you haven't thought about doing it, might be a good time to start on the solstice to figure out what seeds you need and what plants you need to grow. Some of my catalogs are flower plants that I'm going to be growing for that exact reason. It's it's not all about tomatoes and carrots. There's a lot of other aspects of it as well. And Nikki's right. Plant your native milkweed. Showy milkweed is my native in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in the United States, there's, there's uh, primarily three different types of milkweed um, that tend to be favored. The showy milkweed, the swamp milkweed. I actually have one forget the exact name, um, but it's known as butterfly weed. Uh, that's another very common milkweed that, that, that is planted for the, the butterfly. So what I found is it's just a few that you'll find from seed catalogs if you want to grow the plant from seed yourself. But absolutely, uh, look within your area because some of these plants will do extremely well, like the swampy milkweed can actually take over if you grow it in an area where it's native. And that's one reason why we have we have such a problem with the migration patterns of monarchs here in the United States is because milkweed has grown for years and years and years along roadways and waterways and has become an invasive plant in some of those areas, at least deemed invasive. And so it's been eradicated with, that, with no regard for the fact that it's the plant that the monarchs are eating. And so you, you have these efforts from people saying, save the monarch. Well, it's because often in their area, the native milkweed was wiped out by the, the city or county because it was beginning to take over. So if you do grow, just be aware that, that you've got to maintain control over it or the city might come in and try to eradicate it. I've seen that we, we have some uh, noxious weeds in our area. My neighbor at my last house was growing some plants and uh, it was designate, it was on the designated noxious weed list and got a notice from the city that said you got to get rid of this this plant. And so it was a, um, a spurge that just happens to take over when it gets into any setting in my area. And so look for those kind of things and be aware of those kind of things that when you try something new in your garden, it does need to match and it should be native to your area. So that was a good suggestion. Heidi says, I put a saucer in my garden with gravel in it and fill with water so the top of the gravel is sticking out so the bees and butterflies can land and drink. I put a dripper in it. Great idea. Great idea. <clears throat> it doesn't need to be much. A wet stone is, is really cool. And to see this as well, to see a butterfly land on a wet stone in a saucer you have in your garden, and, and you just, it, it's so enthralling to just watch butterflies land on a, a gravel-filled saucer. And uh, so great, great suggestion, Heidi. That, that's, that's easy to do. And I like the dripper idea because in my area, it, things dry out so quickly that you've got to add water to a saucer like that multiple times a day. But if you set it up with a dripper, you can easily take care of that with a minimum amount of work. So appreciate that. That's good. Orful says, all the plants in my yard are native to earth. That's good enough. Yeah, that, that's a good point. If if it's growing in your area, then then the earth is telling you that it's okay to, to be growing in your area. Jay says, milkweed was on the noxious weed list, but has been removed in Ontario, Canada. Oh, good. Good. Glad to hear that. You know, and I think some of it is just awareness. Uh, 
plants that do well benefit the animals and the insects that are native and also can benefit from that plant. Now, when we introduce a plant from some other region and we don't have those natural pest controls the, the, and the animals that can come in and keep the plant in balance, then yeah, that's definitely a problem. But so often we just see milkweed growing along a road and consider it noxious weed because we don't want plants growing along a road. When really, if you just take a step back, you can recognize that it really isn't noxious. It's just something that somebody decided at one point they didn't want there. And there's a lot of the rest of us that do want those plants. So uh, look around for your area, look at some of those noxious weed lists. And I wouldn't be surprised if you're not growing some of those plants because a lot of the noxious weeds, I know at least in my area, were gardening plants that were brought in decades ago because they were popular and then they escaped and and have started pushing out some of the native plants. And that's really what makes them noxious in a lot of cases is they push out a lot of the native plants. So there's this balance that you have to maintain if you choose to grow some of those plants. Okay, let's see. Applied Knowledge is saying, um, I can't find the tubers. I live in South Dakota. Um, look for seeds. Um, the tubers for a lot of flowers in particular are the primary way of growing. <clears throat> but particularly with new cultivars, those new cultivars are almost always developed from seeds. And then we just use the tubers to, to, to clone and grow that same particular cultivar that we're growing. But you may have some success finding seeds depending on what kind of, of tubers you're looking for. Uh, let's see, Jani says, in my vegetable garden, I have a little pond and plants for butterflies and bees. I think that's a good idea. That's that's one of those things that, that we all can do. Uh, you know, it could just be a saucer filled with water and gravel. It could be a full-size pond with waterfall, or it could just be a little pond and maybe uh, just a little fountain. But but I, I, I like that approach, Jenny. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because we should be thinking about our butterflies and bees in our garden. Too often it's an afterthought. And so if you make the time to think about it, you can actually really benefit the entire garden as a whole. Uh, Empress Kimberly says, I'm trying artichoke from seed this year. And that's awesome. I wish I'd known how tough they were to grow before I bought the seeds. Yeah, depending on where you are, they are extremely tough to grow. Uh, in my area, they're on my list. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to grow them this year. I was just looking at seeds the other day. And I, I'm, I'm probably going to do it next year. But, but I'm going to put a dedicated bed because it is a difficult plant for some of us to grow. As far as the soil, the sun, the nutrients, and in my case, the length of the growing season, everything just has to be perfect. I only know of one gardener that I've encountered here in my area that grows artichokes with any success. Most of us will try it once and then give up because it can be tough. So uh, good luck to you. Um, definitely start them early and uh, get them outside as a plant. That, that most often helps. And so let us know how it goes at the end of the gardening season to figure out if it's going to, to work as well. Heidi says she's trying artichoke from seed as well. Good for you. It's, uh, there's, I'm trying to, remember, I don't remember off the top of my head, uh, but, but based on talking with gardeners in my area, there's really only one variety that has any hope. And that's the one I was looking at. I've got it noted on my, my seed sheet, but, uh, good for you. If you can grow artichokes, I say go for it. Britt Mai says, I'm in Georgia and it's hard to keep standing water around because of the constant battle with mosquitoes. And, and that's that's one of the, the reasons why uh, a gravel filled uh, saucer or, it, and, and this, is, this is what I'll be doing, a disappearing fountain. And so this is what I built at the school garden where you actually have the, the, the water reservoir buried 
and on top of that reservoir you have the stones and so you have your water cascading onto those stones and then disappearing below ground and so there is no standing water for the the uh, mosquito larva because it it's all underground and so there's an option if you want to have some type of water feature in your garden and a wet stone is all that those bees and butterflies need so so i totally get get the the hesitancy because we don't want to be adding any extra mosquitoes if we don't have to but there are options within a garden of having water without it being an open standing area uh, and and i had this the, the same problem which is why um, the next water feature i'm going to do is going to be the the disappearing even that little fountain that that i show in a video from last year where i had a little tub and i do have some rocks in and around it with a little fountain well the 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 little pump broke so i wasn't getting that circulation of water and within a couple days i had the mosquito larva show up in my my little tub that i was using for the the insects and animals within my garden but look up bt bacillus thuringiensis and that's what i did is i got these little discs that float on the water and it's a bacteria that attacks the mosquito larva and kills it and so i did that i, I filmed it of course uh, at some point i'll show it in a video but i had all the all the larva swimming in the water and then I put this BT floating disc on top of that, that tub, and it killed all the mosquito larvae inside of it. So a couple of options, the disappearing water so you don't have any standing area for the mosquitoes, or use the BT to, to kill the, the mosquito larvae. Totally natural, it's bacteria that does all the work for you, and it's very effective. So uh mosquitoes are a pain but you definitely can deal with them a couple different ways urban chicken mama is saying i grew artichokes for the first time last season had great success good for you two plants are currently in my greenhouse in pots and they're huge i'm glad to hear that that's that's another big issue uh about growing artichokes is they take up a lot of space and don't give you a lot of artichokes so you've got to have the space but they can grow into big plants. But I'm, I'm, it's on my list, like I said, it's something that I, I want to attempt to have success with at some point. So let's, let's see that we can, let's keep our fingers crossed that we can actually get to that point. Uh, rudimental gardening is saying, putting in a rain harvesting system for this spring summer, purchasing two 330 gallon totes. Wow, hoping this will be enough water to handle the dry spells. Uh, I, I hope they will too. And so, uh, you know, not, this is another part of planning your irrigation within your garden. As you water, start keeping track of how much water you're using. Now, in my area where I pay for water, I definitely keep track of it. And, and it goes up a little bit in the, the, the summer during the growing season. But it might surprise you either how little or how much water you're using. And so if you're using a hose to hand water, measure how much pressure and how much water flow you have in that hose. And so I take a, a, a two gallon watering can and then turn the hose on and you can measure how long it takes to fill that watering can. And so it takes about a minute for my hose to fill my two gallon watering can. So the flow of my water is two gallons per minute. Then when I get out to the garden and start watering, I can figure roughly that if, that if I'm spending 30 minutes actively putting water onto the plants, then I've do, done 30 minutes times two gallons per minute, and it's taken me 60 gallons of water to water my garden on that day. And so now when you look at, at two 330 gallon totes, assuming that you've got that, let's, let's say they're not gonna be absolutely full all the time, but let's say you have 600 gallons to use 
and you're using 60 gallons a day, a day <coughs> excuse me, then that's 10 days worth of watering from that watering system. And that's, that's a quick, easy way to figure out if that's enough or if you need more. <clears throat> as, as I've said recently, here in, in Colorado, we have laws now as to how much water you can save. We can only save 100 gallons. And so in my case, this is one of those things where I'm, I'm going to do it for some of those dry spells, just supplemental watering. But the water I can save is really only maybe two days worth of water. And unless we have rain, they're not going to be filled up again. And so you have to balance the effort and the expense and the benefit whenever you have some type of rainwater harvest system. But if you get the rain, and especially if you have to pay for the water, it might be uh, an option to consider. So thanks for sharing that with us. I hope the system works out as you're expecting it because I would do more if I could. <clears throat> At the last house, uh, I was actually hoping when I heard they were going to be rewriting the law, I was hoping they would allow, allow us to save more because when we get some of our thunderstorms here in Colorado, it dumps hundreds of gallons onto our roof in a single storm. And I was hoping to get a 300-gallon cistern that I was going to bury on the upper part of, of the hill and use that to water the garden, which was on the lower part. But then when the law showed that you can only do 100 gallons, it kind of defeated that hope and that potential plan. But uh, do it if you can. Christine says, is it necessary to remove a zucchini plant past its growing time? I'm in Arizona. Um, necessary is a relative term, <coughs> especially in Arizona. And, and another great time of year for areas like zone eight and nine and ten to start thinking about putting your seeds and your plants in because you're going to start getting more sun during the day the plants are going to germinate and be able to grow but if the plant is already spent like a zucchini plant you're not going to benefit much from keeping it in the ground right now uh, other than it's going to take some effort to go out and 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 take it out the the thing to look at is uh, like in my area, my Huga culture mound where I have my squash and had my zucchini plants growing. I just left all that in place so that all of those old vines and leaves just fell on top of the soil as extra mulch, extra organic matter on top of the soil. So I didn't remove my, my dead zucchini plants because they're just dried up and adding to the organic matter. But if the zucchini plant is still alive, which it might be, and it's not producing, might as well get rid of it and clear up that space, get some amendments in there so that it can be all ready to go when you're ready to plant here soon, I'm guessing. And hopefully it is going to be happening soon. <clears throat> Luna says, I want to cry every time I see it rain and I'm not capturing it. I need to get a barrel for something like that. Um, you know, and, and so my solution, because I can't, actually collect the rain is to put organic matter in the soil and to use mulches so that when it does rain the rain goes into the soil that organic matter in the soil are like millions of little sponges to help hold the soil moisture and then the mulch on top reduces that evaporation from the soil into the air so that's my solution. So uh, I totally get it. I I almost cry when I see some of these storms and wish I could save that water. But instead, I'll go back a week or two later after some of those big storms we had over the summer, especially in that area where I've got six inches of wood chip mulch around my fruit trees and the soil underneath is still moist from a rainstorm that might have happened weeks before. So Mulch can be very effective if you don't have the option of actually saving the, the water that you have. Dow's Homestead says, I received my allium bulbs and assorted flowering onions, highest lengths. It's too cold for me to be outside. How can I keep these indoors until spring? Bowls with gravel and water. So um, if the bulbs and the tubers and the rhizomes, uh, they should have a, arrived in a dormant 
state. And so <clears throat> the best thing to do if you get the the bulbs and and rhizomes and tubers and corms and all those things that that you would be putting in in autumn and you can't put them in in autumn you need to try to maintain that dormancy so if you've got a cool spot and it should definitely be below 50 degrees fahrenheit 10 degrees celsius that's that's ideal that'll help keep them dormant and then when you can get them outside and put into the soil you can put them outside and put them into the soil. Uh, try if if you uh, put them in gravel and water, and it's it's warmer than that, then they're going to start growing. They're going to wake up, and they tend to do better when you can put them in the ground while they're dormant. So try to keep them dormant in a cool spot. You can even put them in your refrigerator to maintain that dormancy. Uh, if they arrived and they had already started growing because it is warmer then yes, this might be a situation. And, and I would consider potting them up rather than putting them in, in uh, bowls with gravel. I've done this before too. Just take some of your old black plastic pots that you probably have and pot them up and, and treat them like any other growing plant. And then you can transplant the whole thing into your garden sometime in the springtime. So uh, take, it, it, it depends on what stage they're in right now. But in either case, they should probably stay cool. A lot of those plants do need the cool and cold temperatures to even flower. So if they don't get that cold, uh, they'll, they'll grow, but you may not get flowers in the first year uh, that, that you're hoping to get the flowers from. So let's see what we have. Oh, yeah, Heidi is kind of saying the same thing. If you put them in gravel and water, they sprout and grow and uh, bedding or peat moss in a cool place is a better idea. Thank you, Heidi. It's always nice when we share the same ways of doing things. That's great. Uh, let's see, Jenny saying, I'm going to have dinner. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Try to send a picture of the garden. Good day to everybody. Good day to you, Jenny. Nice that you could be here with us and hope you have a great week. And, you know, as, as we this is one of those weeks that, uh, let, let me take a look, uh, was wondering, uh, wasn't sure whether we would have fewer viewers or more viewers, because this is a Christmas week here in the U.S., and so I know there's a, a lot of people that might be on vacation this week, so it actually looks like a, a, a few fewer than we usually have, because it's also shopping time, and so I, I wonder how many gardeners are actually out shopping right now rather than spending time with us on this monday but uh it, it's all good so nice to have you here this is time of year when things tend to slow down in the garden which is why i'm ready for it to start picking up again the day's getting longer then the night's getting shorter the day's getting warmer it's coming for me here in colorado february is my least favorite month because it tends to be the month that is the coldest and so I'm hoping we can just breeze right through January and February and then start getting into that March, April time frame. But uh, keep your fingers crossed with that. I will be starting some seeds here pretty soon, some of those perennial flower seeds. Another thing in a lot of areas around the world, the solstice, the winter solstice in particular, is a time for starting seeds in those areas where you can actually be putting plants in the ground in March and April. This time of year may be the time to start thinking about putting some of your your pots and lights to use to get those seeds going. So it's all about you and your garden as to what time works best. But start thinking about it because without, at least in my case, without a, a, a plan and a date to start that plan, a lot of things just don't happen. And so you, you know where to find me tomorrow morning for sure is curled up with my seed catalogs as I roll through and decide what I'm going to do. Una says, I was supposed to be shopping today, but the day got canceled, so I'm glad I was able to make the live chat. I'm glad you were here too. It's one of those things that, uh, it's all priorities, and I totally get it. It's a, it's a question of which priority is more, and I think family and often shopping for the family can be a more important priority. Let's see, Jay is saying, 
This week, I was scavenging branches for the Hugo Culture beds for next spring and for holiday displays along with grapevine wreaths. Good for you. Um, you, know, you know, I've seen grapevine wreaths. I've never done a grapevine wreath, but I like that idea. <clears throat> and scavenging the branches for the Hugo Culture, always a great idea. Uh, the uh, I've got uh, two trees in my backyard that technically might still be alive, but because of the droughts we've been having in recent years and because of the weird late freezes in the spring and early freezes in the fall, a lot of the trees in my area have died. And so I'm going to be cutting those trees down. Actually, I'll be cutting one tree down. <clears throat> and so here's an idea. I'll be, I'll be showing this in a video, of course. The other tree, it's a willow tree, which is a terrible choice for Colorado. But somebody planted a willow tree in my backyard years and years ago, and it's dying because there's just not enough water. So I'm actually going to cut down most of the branches from this dead and dying tree and keep the central leader and a few of the branches at the top. And that's where I'll be putting my bat house. And then I'll also be putting some other bird houses higher up in that dead tree. And so I'll, I'm looking forward to having all those branches to put into some of the other beds that, that I'll be building. But as you prune, or if you have a dead tree, I'll just kind of throw that out at you. Think about how you might be able to use that tree to your benefit to attract some of the birds and bats that you might have in your area. Because a bat house needs to be pretty high and like at least 15 feet above the ground. And it's hard to to construct a pole that, that that's that high. Whereas you might have a tree that, that is that high and you could put a bat house in an old dead tree and you didn't even know that you had that option because you were thinking about cutting down the old dead tree. So I'm, I'm hoping to get that project done this year and see if I can actually entice some bats to my garden. That would be awesome. Stinky Vision says, seems like I can never make the show on time, but I'm here. Awesome. Great to have you here. Checking in from Denver. Thanks for all the content. You are very welcome. And Denver also is going to have a nice warm week ahead with no snow in sight. So uh, it's, it's hard to hard to get into that Christmas spirit when we're thinking gardening and there's no snow on the ground. So I hope if you uh, ha normally have a, a white Christmas in your area that you do indeed have a white Christmas this year, but uh, there's no guarantee. I certainly know that we're not going to have it here. Uh, Bobby G. Ration says, new the channel. Thank you so much for the knowledge, and I am always glad to help out. Uh, was thinking a lot about that this week. So the video I did last week where I, I talked about why gardening is hard. It's taking uh, a, a simple idea that is actually hard to put into practice because of all those little things that can go wrong. And getting it right just seems to be a challenge sometime. Well, my knowledge comes from all of those mistakes that I've made over the years, all of those little lessons that that I had to learn often the hard way. And that's why I share it, because I did learn it the hard way. And I hope to actually make things easier for all of you. So I appreciate you saying that. But uh, my, I don't think my knowledge is anything uh, extra special. I've just had more time at it. And I think everybody has the potential of becoming an expert gardener, a master gardener. Whether you actually go to a certification program or not, we all have that ability to become experts in this particular field in our own garden. Because that's, that's really all you need to do. You don't need to be like me and go teach classes and make videos and all the rest. You can just be an expert within your own landscape. And I think that's 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 really all you need to, to focus on. Because if you can achieve that point, then maybe you'll become comfortable enough to actually begin sharing and teaching those ideas with others. Stony Gardener says, I'll be planting blueberries this spring. What would be the safest way of acidifying the soil in preparation? Thank you for all the knowledge. It's interesting you ask this because this was one of the big subjects I was researching this week because I want to grow blueberries as well. And uh, I can't 
in my native soil. Blueberries need a low pH. 4.5 to 5.5 pH is typically the range that blueberries like, need, and my soil is 7.0 pH. So I can't grow uh, blueberries in my soil, which now means I need to develop a bed or and or containers to grow the blueberries. And so that's why this is a good question because in the soil in those containers or new beds, I'm planning on doing a, a low raised bed and two containers for the blueberries that I'm hoping to put in this year. I need to acidify the soil because I can't just use my own soil and expect that it's going to be the low pH that the blueberries need. And so the, the most common way of acidifying a garden soil is with elemental sulfur. And so sulfur will lower the pH. It, it does take a little bit of effort, a little bit of math, a little bit of experimentation, because you should measure the pH of the soil you're starting with. And then if you get the sulfur through a gardening source, and a lot of nurseries are selling sulfur, the, the bagger box of sulfur should tell you what the application rate is to lower the pH to whatever your target happens to be. So for blueberries, let's say a 5.0 pH is what we're targeting. Well, in my case, starting with a 7.0 pH, I would have to read the directions on the sulfur and find out how much I should be adding so that I can bring the pH down to that target. And then it helps to take another pH reading to be comfortable that, that your soil is now at a, a 5.0 so that you can plant the blueberries. So sulfur is the most common and typically the most effective way of acidifying the soil. Now there are short-term solutions that I see people talk about all the time. Pour vinegar, that'll acidify your soil. Well, yeah, it'll, it will acidify the soil, but it's gonna dissipate. So it has a very short-term effect. In the meantime, that, that vinegar is killing a lot of soil life. So I'm not a big fan of those quick fixes to try to get your soil uh, at a lower pH. You might be able to find some potting soil. Uh, you might have to search a little bit. A good place to start is a nursery. But, but if you find a potting mix for azaleas, it will also work for blueberries. Azaleas are an acid-loving flower and much more common than blueberries. So you'll often see a potting mix for azaleas without, under, or without recognizing that it's also a good potting mix for blueberries. So that's the approach I'm actually going to take and planning to do a video about at some point in the, in the months ahead is to find a good source for an azalea mix, do a pH test, and then determine how much sulfur I might need to add to get the pH down to the level I'm looking for for the, blue, the blueberry growing. And it's a, it's a shallow rooted plant, so it can actually be grown pretty well in a container. And that's, that's the approach I'm gonna be taking. So you don't need to acidify a large area of soil. You only need to acidify the soil where you're going to be actively growing the blueberry. So hope that it helps. And as far as a safe way, uh, I, I would definitely say sulfur is safe as opposed to something like vinegar or one of those other things you might see uh, on the Internet that tells you how to acidify soil. It's not going to be safe and it's only going to be temporary. Okay, I, I see Heidi and Clark um, saying thanks for being here today, Eli and Kate. So I'm guessing that they're headed out. Appreciate that you were here today and so glad that we could do that, that video together. <coughs> so if you're still on, Eli and or Kate, I uh, hope you have a nice week and we'll be chatting as we look at more videos to come. Shandy's Garden saying, I heard blueberries do best in containers. Isn't that right? And so best is a relative term. And so <clears throat> there, are, there are a number of different types of blueberry plants. 
And so the, the tall blueberry plants that they'll often find in areas like, like Maine and New Hampshire, they do best in the ground in those regions that have cold winters and acidic soil. And so if you're trying to grow one of those tall blueberry plants, uh, they do better in the ground because those plants can actually get six, even eight feet tall. And in a container, they're not going to do as well. But for most of the blueberries that you'll find uh, at a nursery in your area or online, they're, they're going to be the smaller, more the mid-size, probably three feet tall kind of blueberries, maybe four feet tall. And yes, they often do best in containers because of the soil needs. Not, not many of us have the perfect blueberry growing conditions. And so containers are the way that we can develop that soil to grow them best. So it all depends. It all depends on what your soil is and where you are and whether the conditions are are right for blueberries in the ground. And if they're not right for blueberries in the ground, then do it in a container. And in that case, yes, I would say that growing in a container is the best way. It is the best way for me, beyond a doubt. If I'm going to grow blueberries, I really need to be growing them in a container. Karen W. says, cutting wood and splitting, so too busy to join until now. Glad you can join us, although I'll rewatch for acidifying. Merry Christmas from southwest of Thunder Bay. Merry Christmas to you as well. And glad you could get out and get some chores done. And you can join us on the replay and catch up with all the stuff that, that you missed. Mage Graywell says, I'm going to build a cage with a door around the blueberries so the birds don't eat them all. Not a bad idea. I... I tend. I was thinking about this uh, recently because um, I had currants and gooseberries. In this, this was the first year that I had currants and and gooseberries from the plants that I put in last year. And I thought about harvesting. I I plucked and ate some of them, but I left them for the birds. But now I have so many currant bushes and gooseberries in particular, and that. Next year, I'm hoping to have more to harvest. And every year after that, I'll have more to harvest. And I've been thinking about that, that trade-off. How much do you let the birds take and how much do you harvest yourself? And so if, if you just have a, a, a limited supply, yeah, bird netting, a bird cage is definitely an option to take. Because like in my case, I thought, oh, the granddaughters came to visit. I'm going to go out and we'll we'll eat some of the currants. They were all gone. The birds had already eat all of those nice ripe currants. So I will need to take some protective action in the future. Uh, in the past, with plants like that, I I tried to do my harvest timing with the anticipation of when the birds would eat most of the fruit. And especially with my grapes, I got pretty good at it. After years of going out and half the grape, the grape crop was gone from the birds, I began to recognize when the best point was to harvest the grapes. And I could usually beat the birds by a day or two. So there's another option depending on what it is that, that you're trying to, to grow. Britt Mai says, I had two currant bushes that I planted, but they lost all their leaves late summer. The wood doesn't seem dead, but I'm not sure what happened. Uh, it, it, could be extreme summer conditions. There's a lot of reasons for leaf drop. Could be dry wind. Um, but if the wood still looks good, uh, I would expect that you're going to start seeing sprouts here in early spring. And hopefully that's what's going to happen. And they're going to, to pop up again. So keep your fingers crossed for, for that to actually happen. Uh, let's see. Lots of good stuff about... Um, yeah, Karen says put blueberry berries in that are native. If you if you live in an area, this this gets back to the whole idea of planting what's native in your area. If if you live in an area that has native blueberries, yeah, that's the blueberries you, you should be growing, like those tall varieties that are growing in the northern United States. That's why they do best there, because that's exactly the 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 plant to be growing. If you live in another area and have a different type of native blueberry, 
go forward as well. I think that's that's definitely the option to take. It's for those of us where blueberries aren't native that we have to try to choose which one will grow best in the container that we're growing the blueberries in. So we do have lots of options to choose from, but but there, there's no native blueberries anywhere near my area. I wish I wish we could have some, but uh, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Okay, let's see a couple more, and then we'll get towards that point that we're closing out. Uh, and so uh, I, I mention occasionally the membership uh, that we have here on the Gardner Scott channel. And so if you're on a PC, you'll see the little blue and white uh button underneath the video that says join you can push on that to join the channel uh, you can also go to the main gardener scott page on youtube and join i also have links underneath my videos that you can join and and it's a way to help support the channel but it's also a way to get some extra perks that that i offer like the the facebook group that we have where just great information being passed back and forth sharing photos sharing videos it's a great way to really uh, get to know some of the gardner scott community some of the the channel members and one of the perks if you're at the training or the collaborator level is uh extra live streams and early access to videos and occasionally uh, videos that are only for the the channel members at that level and so today after this live stream, I'll be doing a, an extra live stream just for those channel members. So I just want to throw it out there. No obligation, no pressure. But if you're looking for a way to help support the Gardner Scott channel and you want to also participate with those other members and get some of those perks, channel membership is a way to do it. And it's, it's things like the extra live chat that I'll be doing here as soon as we finish this one, we'll be doing that extra one for the channel members. So for those of you that are channel members at the training or collaborator level and you didn't see my message, stick around when we're done here and you'll go ahead and get that opportunity. Uh, and Empress Kimberly saying you need PayPal. No, no, it's not PayPal. It's actually through uh, YouTube. I think you might have a PayPal option. Um, but what I've seen is a credit card. And so it, it's charged to your credit card. There's different levels that you can take a look at and different perks at those levels. But it's primarily a credit card. That, that's my understanding of how it, it all works. So if it's something you're interested in, check it out. And uh, again, no pressure. I'm still doing my normal videos. I'm still doing these Monday live streams. It's just a way to, to give a little bit extra to those that want to support the, the channel in extra ways. Colorado Bird Nerd, thank you so much. Merry Christmas to you as well. Thanks for all the gardening knowledge, sharing. Love your Monday morning gardening chats. I love them too. And I love that you're here on Mondays to, to participate. And I, I really do appreciate that super chat. And that's actually how I wanted to end today. And during this, this, this Christmas week here in, in the United States, there are a lot of holidays during this time of year. I know some of the holidays have already finished. There are a few more yet to come. For those of us that are celebrating Christmas, Christmas is coming at the end of the week. So I hope this whole holiday season for all of us uh, has been a good one for you in particular. And if you celebrate Christmas, I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. I hope you are getting all of those those gardening presents that you asked for along the way. I, I'm expecting and hoping for, and I'll actually be disappointed if I don't get a new pair of gardening gloves because my daughter gets me a nice pair of leather gloves every year. And I go through at least one pair of gardening gloves every year. In the years that I'm actively building the garden and working with a lot of stone and wood, I'll go through multiple pairs of gloves. I think uh at the last house i was i put in a stone patio and built a, a pergola did a lot of digging i think i went through five pairs of leather gloves that year this last year was much better i've only gone through one pair and it's getting 
uh, to the point that I need another pair, and that's what I'm hoping to find under the tree this Christmas. So I hope you find whatever it is you're looking for under the tree for Christmas, but I also hope you're, you're giving to others, giving that gift of gardening, giving your knowledge, giving your experiences to all of those around you. At the gardening club meeting this last weekend, I took a big stack of garden catalogs that I've just accumulated over the last couple of years to give away to the other gardeners who may not have been aware of some of those seed catalogs that I order from. And I think I probably took 25 catalogs. They were snapped up by the end of the meeting. So it, it, it doesn't have to be anything fancy when I say give the gift of gardening. It could be just sharing an old seed catalog with someone who's never ordered from that seed catalog. It could be as simple as over the holiday meal, you share some of what you've shared today, some of the stories in the chat from today or previous weeks, share some of those stories with your family and friends over the holidays because winter solstice is one of those anchor points to get us thinking about what's coming what's going to happen in our gardens over the next six months until the next solstice comes. So use this day as that opportunity to get started on the next six months, to get your planning going, but to share the gift of gardening in whatever form that means. And I didn't really think in terms of the gifts I was giving when I brought those catalogs to the, the meeting this weekend. Afterwards, I thought, yes, that really was a gift. Whoever it was that took the different catalogs to them, their world was, their gardening world was enlarged. And they got a new experience looking through catalogs that I've already enjoyed multiple times. So think about what you can do to, to just do something easy, to spread the word of gardening, to help someone else in their gardening journey, or more importantly, to help someone start that gardening journey. And the solstice is a great time for you to take that action and get someone else started along this path that we all love so much. So I hope that you have a wonderful week ahead. I hope it's a Merry Christmas for everyone who celebrates Christmas. And I'll see you back again next Monday, same time, same channel, to talk about all those gifts we did get. And if I did get my leather gloves, we'll see you then. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.